So my name is Matthias Lemmer from the Austrian Post and I'm heading the uh, data address, address management department. And this department is basically dealing with um, data for B2B customers. So we try to help our B2B customers get better in their marketing efforts. That's, that's the main idea. Um, and I will start, start with three motivation slides because usually thinking about um, data is, is like, you know, big data is one of these passwords, everybody uses it. The question is, what's in there? Um, and it's also the other discussion that we hear recently, and I will come to that a little bit later, but I will only uh, hit in on it. It's the GDPR, so everybody is, uh, knows now, okay, there is something coming up, um, giving us relations about uh, data security, how to deal with customer data. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting time, um, how we deal with that. Um, and the motivation here is, one thing is for sure, as opposed to company, um, that we have a lot of data out there that we can reach because we are there in the feed. Um, and what does this mean? I mean, the demographic structure of a country, in this case, so this is Austria, uh, in this case, it's an important source for B2C uh, players. Meaning, for example, if you have retailers, of course, they want to know how people and where people are, how much they earn. This is one example. The distribution of the purchasing power, for example, is a very interesting uh, information for them. And on the other end, what I just said is that as a post company, we are everywhere at every door. So we, we are in a field, we are very limited to the citizen. And why don't we use that, that knowledge that's uh, being there in the field and leverage it for, for, um, uh, so, so, uh, for, for making money with uh, this data? And this is the, the main idea. So bringing these two together means um, we have these postmen out there that have a lot of impressions which we are in with marketing terms, which basically means they are in the field out there. On the one hand, there's a lot of data available, so, so how can we use that? Um, knowing nearly every Austrian uh, means uh, having this large source of interesting data for a company. That, that's the point I want to make. Um, so take, take, for example, this guy. Um, I call him Romeo Julianson in Capital Street. Um, because we are getting, you get the, the joke on the next slide. Um, uh, of course, uh, there is no city that's like that. But, um, uh, so, so take, take this for example, uh, this guy. The interesting thing is you have to use this basically. So, for example, if one of the companies um, that are our customers um, already has this guy in this database, he might know um, that uh, he spends this money on the, those uh, goods uh, all the time. Um, he knows how often he, uh, he uh, buys something. That's everything he has. But he might not know that he's also a business owner, there are two kids in his household, um, and he's even a heavy owner shopper. And this is information that we can give additionally so that the companies can better understand their customers and then, of course, target the market expand even better, uh, for example, for a specific campaign or something. And the second use case is taking take out this guy who is not in the database of another uh, retailer. Um, and this retailer says, okay, I want to have people that are performers, uh, that are digital native, uh, that have a high salary income, uh, that like to invest, um, and who's always paying on time, no hard payments, and so on. And this is also information that uh, this is these other companies could use to select from a variety of possible customers and uh, get this data for direct marketing efforts. So we have these two use cases. Um, either you know the customer that we can help in with all our data in, the, in our information database um, to better understand them, or you can use this data to select uh, potential new customers. And now, um, I, hope, I hope this works. Can you start the video? Weil es sich auch nicht die wunderschöne Alfa Romeo Giulia von selbst verkauft, haben wir von der Post dafür eine perfekt optimierte Dialogmarketing-Kampagne geplant und umgesetzt. Neugierig? So könnten wir auch Ihre Umsätze finden. So, what, what uh, the guy said in the video is just, um, even such a nice car doesn't sell on its own. Um, so, uh, we from the Austrian Post helped um, the campaign uh, to, to work. Um, and this is called, uh, there's a department uh, that Austrian Post called Pink My uh, Department uh, for Dialogue Marketing. And they have this 
really my campaign efforts, which means they help customers to better uh, optimize the campaign and to design the campaign. Um, and what has it all to do with the, with the data? I'm coming to that uh, uh, now. So that the basis for such a campaign is, again, this large customer database with the deep information about consumers in Austria. Why? Because um, what we did in this case is uh, we took the database of um, Alfa Romeo, the, the existing uh, customers they had over the last years. Um, as usual, this was data that was not in a very good um, status, which means uh, there were addresses wrong, um, even already typed or people moved, etc. So the first thing we did is we clean data, then we use this data to profile the typical customer, which means um, we match it with our um, comprehensive database with all the deep information and extracted what are the criteria um, that are most likely to make a, to make a consumer an after only a buyer. Um, and if you use this, you can then extrapolate to the whole um, country and say, okay, how many, um, so to say, lookalikes are in your data that you can possibly use for such a campaign. And then uh, the campaign was with direct mailing, so we were using the addresses from this program, but also on the on online channels. So it was basically a data-driven um, customer insight and selection. Um, and what it actually led to, so the, the, the target was a thousand qualified leads. Qualified leads means uh, not just random guys from, from, um, from the population, but really uh, very likely buyers for the new car. And uh, what the campaign actually um, then, uh, managed to get 3,000 qualified leads and um, a cost per order of 1,000 euro, which is for this case, for cars uh, in this price range, a really good, good number. Um, and the, the really nice thing also for our client in this case was that the 50% uh, of all those buyers that actually then bought the car um, were, were first time buyers. So they really uh, had the opportunity um, and managed to, to enlarge the database for further um, market expense. So this was one of the possibilities how to, you can use the data. Um, and what I will come now to is now are the content rich slides coming in. Um, because the question is that I told you a lot about uh, yes, as opposed to companies, so we do have a lot of access to deep information, deep insights about the population. Then I show you how, how you can do this uh, for a specific campaign. And now the question arises because okay, how do you get to this deep information and how do you get criteria in a database that has some value to customers or to potential customers, B2B customers? Um, and I will give you two examples. The first one is um, we built a model um, for estimating the, deposit, the likelihood to spend for NGOs. So to donate money to NGOs uh, based on the representative data. Uh, because the hypothesis was if you use this uh, deep insight, uh, you can raise the likelihood of, 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 um, of getting to the right people who are willing to spend for NGOs. Um, because the problem that NGOs usually have is that um, they are, that the later database, they get older and older and addresses decline, so they need to fill up with new potential donators. Um, so what we did is um, we tried to get a precise data set of possible new um, donators, and uh, the, the outcome was, of course, you cannot say, okay, this guy will probably spend 1,000 or 1,500 euros, but rather we said that we just want to have classification and say, okay, there's a high, medium, or low likelihood. So what you usually do is you build a model. You try to, to mathematically build a model, and uh, in this case, we used interview data. So we interviewed, um, I think it was 7,000 people um, uh, all over the population. We had a lot of questions, and one of them was also the willingness to, to, to donate, or whether they already donated or something like that. And then we did the same what I told you before. So we used this representative data, we matched it with the database, extracted relevant criteria, this is what we see below there. Um, and say, okay, there are some criteria in our database um, that, are, that have to have in the model specific weights because um, it is very probable that this is an indicator for the willingness to spend. And then you build a model that uh, gives you a game number. We had this um, yesterday on one of the slides, if you remember. So for those of you who are not familiar with that, um, Gain is an important measure, um, especially for direct marketing, because it says how much, um, compared to, to a random selection of the data, 
how, more, how much more likely are the first, let's say, 1,000 or 10,000 census data to actually fulfill the model. So the, the distance here between the random selection and the actual outcome, that will be the game. You, you train the model, um, you test it, um, and then it says, okay, if we reach a gain of about 16%, uh, that, that is something that the model should be able to then really perform with, uh, with real data. Um, and then, of course, you have to test it and see whether this works. Um, and in this case, you use uh, real data from NGOs, tested it against it, and found out that 80% of all the data has been correctly classified, which is a really good uh, number, because this means, if you, uh, if you uh, then calculate the gain, that you even reach 31% gain. So that in one sentence, the model was even better than they predicted it to be. Um, so this is something we could really um, sell our customers, if you will, and say, OK, we do have uh, very likely uh, dominated addresses. And the second one is, is, uh, is something else. Um, we also had an example yesterday that was funny about the moving. Um, yeah, I think you, you said that the, the good thing with postal companies is they know where people move. Uh, and this is right. And what even cooler is, if you know before that the people move. So usually when we uh, get to know where people move, then this is uh, from a point in time where people probably already have bought new household uh, material, they, um, uh, they, they have already um, done, done a lot before we really know that they move because they, they do something like that, you know, that, that they get in the to the weddings. Um, so the idea here was to try to do a predictive analytics and predict the probability of moving within the next two months. Because then you produce the data and say, OK, retailer, we know there is a strong likelihood that this, this guy will move in the next two months. So you can send him, for example, some, some flyers on new um, washing machines or whatever. So, so that was the idea. And um, what we did is, is quite similar. In this case, we didn't use interview data because it's, it's hard you know, to, to call people and say, hmm, do you think about moving? That's, that's not so good. But we rather um, did an, so to say, an educated guess and said, OK, probably the life phase has something to do with that. So how old are people? How many people live in the household? Um, then also changes in life situation. And interestingly enough, there are addresses in Austria um, that have a high fluctuation. So um, also this is something that, that went into the model. And then there was a lot of uh, trial and error on uh, tuning the model. And uh, as you can see, of course, the gain is here much lower because it's, it's, it's harder to, to estimate the probability of moving. Um, but the approach was the same. You, you, do the, you do the model, you uh, extract the relevant criteria, and then you extrapolate again to the, to the whole population and say, OK, people with this and that criteria in these and that weights um, get um, a higher or a lower probability of um, and then we did the same and uh, tested this, um, and in this case, the test is, and this is a big value if you have in your data bit historicized data, because then you can like, go back in time and say, okay, by that uh, point in time, I apply the model, and then go uh, forward again and say, okay, how much of that I predicted um, really happened? So, how many people really did move? And that's what we did. Um, and we got a 25% data match. Um, and this is uh, really good because if you imagine so there are about five to six percent of real movements within Austria each year, um, probably it's up to ten percent if you calculate all the um, all the you know people um, move out of the flat of their mother or something. So so some so movements that that are not as um, as real movements in the sense that we really get to know it um, than as a post company. So let's say it's 9, 10%. So the gain then, if you will, is between, let's say, 15 to, to 20%. So this, is, um, this was actually quite good. And uh, what can you do with that, of course? Um, so we have a retail chain, a big retail chain, all the data, and really try to, um, or not try to, but they really uh, put the sales campaign on top of this data. Okay, so these were the two content rich slides. Um, I'm nearly finished. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to give you something. Um, so if you don't do this already, then I want to 
list a little bit of the key success factors that we learned, what is important in order to get to this point, to, to be able to send marketing data to get a deep insight. Um, first of all, you need, definitely you need top level management awareness. This is something, of course, selling data um, is a specific thing. You need to hire other people than usually hire. You need to get the IT infrastructure. But there's a lot to it, so you really have to have, to have the buy-in to get the support to do that. Um, and the organization setup is, is important as well. So you have to make sure that, that uh, who is actually the owner of the data and, and all of these things. And then for me, the most important point, and this, this holds for, I think, for every company as well, the real assets are the people. So you need skilled and experienced people. Uh, and this means, in this case, you need real data scientists, you need uh, IT experts who are real database professionals. Because otherwise, you cannot handle the data in the sense that it really gets to these values that I showed you before and really have something meaningful to say in the data. Um, you need market sense because you, it only makes sense uh, to use data that you can actually sell. This is always the, the I think, the most um, the tricky part because um, just having data for the sake of having data doesn't make sense. So you really have to, to be aware what does the market need. This is now what I said before, you have to be carefully conformative, of course. Um, GDPR is more or less just a placeholder, you know. Um, this holds for any law. As opposed to company, you always have to be uh, really strict to the law, I think it's, that's clear. Um, so in, in Austria, we have the case that it's um, legally, um, mm -hmm. it, it, so that there is a law that states, okay, if you do this and that, get the opt-ins, uh, and this is the way, then you can send the data to the party companies for marketing purposes. But only for marketing purposes. So again, you always have to check, is it really marketing purpose? Can you do that? Um, and so on. So this is something that's really important because if you have one city news and everybody writes to pay, uh, the data is not, not used um, for the purpose that it was collected, then that's really a problem. So this is something very important. Quality governance process is clear. Data have to be very good, otherwise companies will not buy from you. Um, and also a, a very important uh, point is the breaking of the silos. Um, with that I mean, you have usually you have, at least uh, post this is the case, you have a lot of databases um, that are historically grown for different purposes um, and they are very spread out with the company. And if you really think about creative ways of using data in your company, this also means you have to get access to the data, you have to really use it. So you have to break this, this silence of thinking that uh, this is my data, I don't give it for any other purpose. Um, so this is something that, uh, that you should, should be aware of. Usually this comes with the top level management awareness, so this, this should work anyway. And for the database setup, um, basically what, what we use is we, we don't only use um, our, our own postman or feed for us to connect the data or something. Um, that's, that's just one of the parts. Um, but of course, we do have external data suppliers. We use web crawling techniques to get publicly, publicly available data from the internet. Um, this works very well, for example, for sports um, affinities, because usually you have these lists on the internet published um, who likes to play tennis or golf or whatever. Um, we use a lot of internal data, of course, um, from within the company. Um, and for some specific aspects, we also use transaction data that we have. Um, and of course, you need quality routines that always clean your data and make sure that there's nothing coming in that's not true or um, not um, safe. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.